All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. My name is Mick Breggy on behalf of Startup Nation and here at the studio today. And I'm also the host of Futurecast, which is an upcoming show featuring a forecast of innovative new ideas uh, with, from different diverse perspectives designed to make a impact on everyday life. Um, so I can't wait to speak to our guest today, but before we go on, I just want to remind everyone that we'll be answering uh, questions and comments in the chat after our talk. Uh, and also to make sure you've entered the ultimate work from home bundle, a $3,500 value, which is everything you need to stay productive and efficient from wherever work takes you from Dell. Okay, so let's talk about Brad Graber. Uh, Brad is the CEO and co-founder behind Powerhouse Animation Studios based in Austin, Texas, leading producer of action animation. His studio is currently in production on Castlevania, Gods and Heroes, Masters of the Universe, Revelation, and Heaven's Forest for Netflix. Powerhouse has a huge background in commercial advertising, games, and short-form content for major brands, too. They've worked with everyone. So uh, growing up around and having a background in animation, uh, but first and foremost, I'm a fan of their projects. I'm super excited to, to speak to Brad today. So welcome, Brad. Hi. I'm excited about it, too. This is going to be fun. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be good to chat with you. So uh, first and foremost, is there anything you want to add before we jump in? Anything you want to tee up with your background or Powerhouse animation? Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, the, the major things are we've been around for about 19 years and we've done animation in just about all the very formats that it has existed. We started off doing feature films. We've done some TV. We've done a lot of video games. Um, but as animation has changed over uh, the past two decades, our business has changed a lot with it. And so uh, it's just recently that we were able to start doing all these wonderful, exciting shows, but we've always been building towards it. Right. And when you say you're building towards something, I think uh, something I wish I had the resources for, and I imagine quite a few of us who are listening today have been wondering about uh, or are also looking for, are the tools to start. Um, so can you talk about your initial background and all the way going through starting Powerhouse? Sure. So uh, me and the other two founders uh, uh, worked at a dot com. And so what happened was I was in grad school at Texas A&M. I was, I was born in Austin uh, and always really loved the city. And an opportunity came up to come work at this dot com that was producing children's animation uh, back in the late 90s. And so uh, they hired a whole bunch of animators from all over the place. And we were producing uh, short animated content online for kids uh, that was using the, the Flash-based platform at the time. And so we all uh, came and worked together. Everybody was still working on paper and we were still doing animation in a very traditional way. Uh, but uh, the dot com went the way of the rest of the dot coms and uh, <laughs> ended up collapsing. And uh, myself and a couple of the other animators uh, didn't want to leave Austin. We really loved the city and loved what it was all about. So we started Powerhouse in the building while they still were, uh, you know, waiting to sublease the space uh, for the, the dot com and, uh, uh, and, and built Powerhouse out of that. Wow. So, you know, something we've had a chance to talk about before, which is kind of what the experience you're describing right now is that uh, animation and working in a creative industry is never really a straight line from A to B. It's, it's always a little bit all over the place and it's constant evolution and iteration. So, um, what do you wish you had known when you're kind of in that intermediary phase and you're making these transitions? Uh, what do you wish you had known about starting Powerhouse? And what, were, what, would be, um, what would be some useful tools for you to know during that time? Well, I mean, it, it, just like it does with everybody due to technology and you know, just the way that things changed, we, we had started off thinking we were going to be a feature film uh, production service group. And what I mean by that was, we, we figured we would be small, uh, but uh, a lot of us had backgrounds working on, you know, uh, my partner Bruce worked at uh, Fox on Titan AE and uh, some of those films and my other partner Frank had worked on a whole bunch of Don Bluth things as well. And so we thought, because it seemed like it would never end, that we would do 2D traditional animation for feature films. And so that's what we did at first. We, we worked on Adam Sandler's Eight Crazy Nights. Uh, we we were doing uh, you know service work for feature films, but shortly after we started, uh, just like kind of the dot com that we came from, uh, that industry changed and they stopped making traditional two D feature films. 
And so we quickly pivoted to working for TV. And so we worked on shows like The Proud Family and things like that, still you know, drawing on paper, putting the paper in FedEx boxes and shipping it off to Disney or whomever. Um, but we were, we were figured that that would also last forever. Um, but then, you know, uh, world socioeconomic things change. And next thing you know, most of television production is being done overseas or being handled in Canada and things like that. And so, you know, we, we went from uh, that to doing uh, things for video games because video games were booming in Austin at the time and people needed designs and cinemas to help tell the stories inside of the game. So like pertinent to your question, like when we started the company, just like most companies, we thought of it in terms of the actual business model, like what was going to drive the revenue and what was the segment of what industry we would work in. It turns out we were really just a artist and animator business. And we just would switch from wherever animation ended up living, as opposed to thinking in terms of being a film business or a TV business or a game business. We were really just a team of talent that needed to find work. Hmm. And that wasn't the original direction that you had set out for? No, I mean, we, I, I, I was young. Uh, I was in my 20s when we founded Powerhouse, but uh, at the time, you know, it didn't seem like after Lion King and all of those films uh, that uh, traditional feature films were going anywhere. So like, it, 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 we thought it would last forever. It certainly wasn't our intention to be making, you know, uh, things like Epic Mickey was never even on the radar, which, you know, Epic Mickey was this game uh, based on a lot of the old uh, Disney properties. Uh, and we ended up doing 2D animated cinemas for inside of that game. Um, but when we had started the company, something like that wasn't even something that we thought would happen. Like it, it, the industries grew and we kind of moved from place to place. And always stayed current. Great. I remember Epic Mickey. I'm a huge fan of that game, both one and two. So I remember when we had a chance to talk beforehand, knowing that you guys had worked on that is, is phenomenal. And the work is, is beautiful. So in that process, or when, you're, when you guys are in the early stages of development, as you, as you mentioned, you're kind of moving from project to project and staying uh, current and contemporary with the, the changing times. Uh, what is the first project that you can pinpoint that you guys worked on? And also to kind of set the stage of what's happening in the animation industry in the early 2000s that you kind of felt like, okay, this is a big opportunity for us. This is a thing that's going to uh, move us forward and kind of propel us along from that initial conception. Well, outside of the Adam Sandler film, uh, Eight Crazy Nights, one of the first things we worked on was a small piece of sample animation for uh, some never made Snoop Dogg uh, animated vehicle. Oh, wow. And so it, it was out of Houston. We got contacted and we, we ended up doing an animated test to, to, to show how it could be done. Flash. At the time, this is all pre-iPhone, which eventually kind of killed Flash. But at the time, uh, the the amazing thing was being able to create animation that people could not just immediately download because, you know, not without getting too technical, you know, the vector-based format allowed Flash, which, you know, was drawn traditional looking animation generally. Uh, it allowed it to, you know, download almost instantaneously because of the file sizes being so small. Um, so, you know, and that also helped out a ton because it started the progress from, you know, digital storage of giant multi, uh, you know, terabyte files uh, to store movies to being able to store things and work on uh, files much simpler. It also started the process of us being able to draw directly into the software. You know, previously we had done, like, I'll, I'll take one of the most egregious examples. We had done some work on a, a Kevin Smith project uh, where we were drawing on paper and then we would go, like, as a, for instance, you know, you would sit there and you would flip the paper trying to recreate, you know, 24 of a seconds with your fingers. And that's how you tested the animation while you were working on it. When you had a segment done, you'd walk down the hall and you'd either on a camera or with a scanner, scan each of your hundreds of drawings uh you know one by one and then put them into the software and then hit render and then an hour later or a couple cups cup, cups of coffee you can come back and actually watch what your animation looked like time 
Um, and that, you know, it took a lot of time. And when you made a mistake, you're like, oh, crap, um, mm-hmm. that didn't quite work. Then you would go back to your desk and you would sit and you'd flip the pages, try to correct your arcs and your mistakes and all of that and recreate the process over and over again. Uh, when we started working with Flash, the drawing tools were inside the software and all you had to do was hit enter and then you would see the way the animation looked properly without having to render or shoot or any of that other sort of stuff. Um, a lot of us fought the transition from paper to drawing directly uh, you know, with a, a tablet or, you know, like a, a canvas or something like that. Um, but, you know, pretty soon, uh, just the being able to see the results of your work and being able to do things like undo as you drew, uh, drew and all that other sort of stuff uh, started to outweigh, you know, a lot of the traditional aspects of doing animation. How does the process of the studio you're talking about kind of these technological processes that improve everything drastically over a course of, you know, drawing traditionally versus uh, uh, being able to, uh, something as simple as being able to undo or maybe onion skinning or something like that. But um, how is the process different from your early days to now from more of the, the, the business or enterprise standpoint when you're thinking about starting out in early stages to now pitching shows. How, is, how, is, how have things different, differed over this period of time? It's changed radically. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, the fundamentals of what we do haven't, hasn't really changed at all. I mean, it's still all about drawing. It's still all about story. It's about character. The, the fundamentals of what we do hasn't changed, but the process has changed radically. I mean, I think the fir- we, when we first started the studio, there was a scanner, a Ricoh scanner, uh, that would do pages, you know, large enough to hold animation pages, uh, you know, one after the other. And like, we thought it was so fast, you know, being at watching it, you know, sheet feed these scans of your animation paper. And I think it was you know, $8,000, $10,000 for the scanner. And so that would take a whole job for the studio to be able to pay for that one asset just to be able to sit there and scan. And then, you know, we, we started hiring younger and younger artists as we grew older as a company uh, and as ourselves. And uh, what ends up happening is they grow up inside of the technology as opposed to, you know, the way that you came up. Like as a, for instance, Powerhouse uh, used to host regular figure drawing sessions because, you know, the best way to learn how to draw, especially for animation is through, you know, anatomy study. And so uh, I remember the first artist that came in and was drawing just on a tablet. You know, they had one of the older draw directly on the screen sort of surface type things. Uh, And just how strange that seemed to the rest of us. And then, you know, years later, you go back and think about it. and There's hardly anybody in our studio that still draws uh, with traditional media. Like it's mainly directly onto a screen you know, through something like a canvas. And, you know, the computers are powerful enough now to where, you know, when we first started, it would take, like I said, it would take hours to render and just to see the work that you're doing. Um, and now it was, it's all just instantaneous. You are able to quickly correct acting and action and all of that other sort of stuff and see it as soon as you're done drawing it, which gives directors more time to think about things it gives them more time to make things better. I mean, it, it just, outside of just the reduction in cost and the improvement in the technology, creatively, it just makes a massive difference because so much of the time that would be wasted on rendering and other processes as that speeds up now gives creative people more time to consider things, try alternatives, uh, experiment, uh, when they wouldn't have had to in the past while they were waiting for something to take three or four days to rent. Right. And, you know, something that you mentioned was uh, the young people coming into your studio were, were kind of influencing this change in direction a little bit as well, alongside uh, you guys in the sense that they were drawing on tablets or something where this medium is traditionally so rooted in hand-drawn. Um, so you said before that the team is kind of what, what drives a creative business. So how do you align the right people and how do you find these people who are going to bring in this innovative technology or at least understand it enough to push your business forward? 
Yeah, it's it's a it's a portfolio based business. I mean, at the end of the day, we you know we we put out calls. Luckily, we're in a a, a good spot right now. Animation is one of those things that can still be produced uh, in a work from home type environment. And so there are when we are looking for folks uh, currently, there's a lot of people that are available and can apply and all of that other sort of stuff. But it, it is straight about the work before we look at a resume, before we think about education background, before we consider that stuff, it's the ability to draw the ability to, you know, emote through characters, all of that other sort of stuff. That's really what matters the most. Like, you know, the, the educational background and even some of the technology background, because we could teach uh, people how to, you know, what keys to use to, to work inside of software. But, um, at the end of the day, the, the uh, 10,000 Malcolm Gladwell hours that it takes to learn how to not just draw, but to draw in motion is something that uh, you, you have to have coming in the door. And so, you know, our people are constantly reviewing portfolios uh, on a very, very regular basis, trying to find the talent that can do uh, what we want to do. Uh, on top of that, though, we are fortunate in that uh, we do a lot of action-based stuff, and we're one of the few studios in America that does. Uh, and there's lots of uh, young people who've grown up watching anime and have a predilection to wanting to work on uh, action-based series. And so uh, we have lots of folks constantly applying to the studio. Uh, becoming an action-based studio, I think that's an interesting point, um, and kind of carving out what your team and what your organization is going to just absolutely excel at, which is that kind of action-based traditional animation uh, style across the many genres that you work in, but finding this one thing that you can pinpoint. How do you get to that point of understanding, like, this is something that we're really good at, uh, and this it, is... Well, we got, we got lucky. Like, um, uh, as it, it kind of ties to that, the agility thing I was talking about earlier when we, when we started the business. Like, we would go from wherever the, you know, people were looking to do anim Luckily, people love animation. And so it finds its way into everything from our phones to, you know, computers to games to all of that. And so we would just follow the business along. In a similar route, we, we ended up doing a lot of work in games, like I said earlier. And games tend to be, uh, because you're actively playing them, they tend to be more action-based uh, uh, properties. And so not only were we able to get uh, our feet wet in a genre that wasn't being explored terribly in you know, other traditional animation studios, um, but the people we were hiring, the younger, more talented than uh, the old guard folks that were coming in the door, like I said, they grew up watching you know, different media. I grew up watching Disney films and, and Looney Tunes. Uh, they grew up watching Dragon Ball Z and you know, uh, you know, Miyazaki films. And so it's kind of where they lent. And then just like any other business, when you're good at something, people want it more. And so what, ha what happened was, you know, uh, extremely talented people like Sam Dietz, who's the director of Cal Castlevania at our studio, um, was able to show in a few smaller projects, music videos, video game cinemas, just this amazing ability to do action. And then when people found out that's something we could do that others couldn't do, then we got more demand for it. As we got more demand for it, we had to uh, seek out artists that could do it as well. And then the studio grew from that. Like it's a, I mean, it's a fancy way of saying supply and demand. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a cornerstone of anybody's entrepreneurial business. Um, but sometimes you don't know that that's what you're going, your business is going to be amazing at when you first start it. It takes, in our case, 15 years before we found that perfect sweet spot uh, that really allowed us to grow. Do you recommend early creative studios that are starting, starting out to kind of identify and carve out that niche or find that aesthetic that they're really powerful in or be more aligned to kind of the jack of all trades perspective? Well, when we, we, when we were first hiring, because of the type of work that we did, commercials and things like that, it was more beneficial to have people who had a little bit of a jack-of-all-trades sort of experience because we didn't know necessarily when we were smaller where, you know, what the next job that came in the door would be. 
Mm -hmm. like, you know, and we might need, it might be more motion graphics. And so you needed a little bit of after effects if you were going to hang around. And so definitely in the early days, there was a little bit of that, but like, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a martial arts guy. Uh, and so like, there's, there's a bit of uh, the um, kind of practice leads you to doing what you're, you're, you're best at. And so the more we did of certain things, the better we got out of it. And now we're in a studio where when you are a storyboard artist, you're just doing storyboard. When you are an animator, you're just doing animation. So there's kind of a little bit, you have to grow into the uh, specificity of it, it seems, but um, there's a little bit of both. How do you stay current as a organization and juggling these different uh, uh, competencies of your people? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, you have to watch a lot. Uh, so like, you know, I, I, everybody, uh, even though you watch animation all day, I do try to stay on top of, you know, a lot of the stuff that's out there, not just in the States, but internationally, you know, there's a lot of amazing animation stuff going on in France right now. Um, and then of course in Japan and a whole bunch of other markets. So yeah, you try to keep your finger on the pulse and watch all of that. And, you know, uh, luckily, it, when you're a studio that's also pitching television concepts, that helps you stay current a lot because you you hear what people are looking for, you you see the things that are doing well, and uh, uh, even though animation is a incredibly laborious, time intensive process, where when you start something, you know it's not for a couple of years until it's going to be out in the public, so you really have to stay on top of that because there is a, a an extreme danger in our business that if you do get behind that um since it takes so long to make things that you'll be incredibly behind by the time what you're working on gets out to market mm. um so we try to push the boundaries of that a little bit right now you know castlevania in my opinion is one of the first shows that really broke uh the mold of being able to do adult content and animated pieces uh, that you know hit, hit the mainstream mm -hmm. uh, up until just as recently as a few years ago, we were constantly being told that unless it was you know, supported by a toy or was for a certain demographic of kids, uh, you know that nothing would would be successful. And so, you know, you kind of have to go against some of that from time to time and like trust your own gut as to what will be successful and, and push on that again, just because it does take so long for what we make to go out to the marketplace. Right. And in trusting your gut and leading your team, how do you guys evolve to the place where you are pitching your own shows where you can identify animation concepts and go like, this is a direction that we believe we should head in and this will be a successful product. You really just, in, in my case, I tried my best to listen to, the, the staff. I mean, we're very lucky in that the studio is is, is very young. Like 80% of Powerhouse is uh, millennial and 50% of it is women. And, you know, we, we have a very diverse, very young, for lack of a better way to put it, studio. And so um, I watch, you know, what they're uh, talking about, what, uh, uh, what shows they're enjoying, what music videos and other animators are you know, uh, pushing them and all of that other sort of stuff. So, you know, you, you have to, you can't get stuck in wanting to make the same sort of pet project that you've always wanted to work on. You have to listen to what the, the younger audience is looking for because that's what's going to eventually serve your product. That's great. I think the, the diversity of perspective there is, is really key as well into understanding different types of, and especially in a creative medium, different perspectives go into different types of creative resources. And so it's really good to hear you say that, you know, you're listening to your people. I think that's absolutely a major tenet to building out the studio to the way that you have. Um, well, and at, at the end of the day, just to add to that, it's, you also got to make sure that it's stuff that's going to inspire them creatively. I mean, if you're not listening and you just end up making whatever job comes in the door, the work is going to suffer. It has to be something that not just, you know, they enjoy watching, but they're going to be 
watching it over and over and over again at 24ths of a second. If they're, if they're not engaged in the material, you'll, you'll get something that's subpar. Right. So what's the balance between trusting your gut and, uh, or following a curve or even listening to your people? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. And I don't know that I a hundred percent know the answer because it changes so much. I mean, and it kind of goes back to that theme that I was talking about when we started the business. Like things radically change very, very quickly. Like, you know, one in one six month period, you might be talking to a network or a streamer that's looking for, you know, something pretty specific. They're looking to counter what the competition is offering. They're looking for something that replicates a pattern that another show replicated. By the time you put together something and have a pitch going, that might that pendulum might have swung in a completely opposite direction. And so you have to find the good in all the different variation things. Like as a you know, IP is probably the best way to to look at that. There's this IP pendulum where people are looking for either something that's uh, you know based on a familiar IP so that they can bring an audience to it before it actually even gets out of the gate to creating original content. And that pendulum goes back and forth uh, constantly in our business. And so, you know, you, you just have to figure out a way that if you are working on an IP, that you make sure that the story is good and the characters are solid and grounded. Or if you're working on an original, you take the same considerations because the foundation is what makes it right. Mm. So has there been a project, even if it's IP driven, that you feel has nailed the middle ground that kind of speaks to your own voice speaks to the studio's perspective and is something that you're just immensely proud of i'm 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 immensely both proud of castlevania and uh another show that we worked on uh says models i'm going I, i'm very proud of what's happening on on the he-man show right now hmm. unfortunately i can't talk a lot about it or uh, a mattel uh tranquilizer dart will hit me <laughs> in the net um but uh the uh castlevania i think you know through the Deese brothers at our studio who worked on it, they were they were mega fans of, of the property. They played the games. Uh, it was them, uh, they encouraged us to pursue it. Like Sam had been working at the studio for quite some time. He heard uh, through the internet that there was a potential that somebody was working on a Castlevania animated series and it was the one thing he ran down the hall and was like, please find who's doing this, where it's at, and let's go out and pitch ourselves to do it. And I think they tonally have the perfect voice. They respect the IP. Um, they want to make a, a show for an audience like them. And so that that really works out. On the flip side of that, Seis Manos is our completely original um, uh, Grindhouse 70s Kung Fu mashup, which mm -hmm. speaks to a lot of my personal interests. And I, you know, I, I think that show turned out fantastic and really proud of what it is out there. Plus it was, you know, set in Mexico and uh, yeah, really had a nice uh, cast and all of that. And it, it kind of, you know, as a studio that was based in Texas, uh, it just it was a real good fit for us as a group. Mm -hmm. So you're working on two different projects. One is, is IP that might be brought to you from a external third party and one that you guys can kind of come up with yourself in house. Um, yeah. How do you uh, find a balance between these types of projects? It, do you prioritize things that have your own voice or are you more focused on, uh, you know, a Netflix property? I mean, at the end of the day, like, that's a great question. Um, it really is about what the bones of the story are. Like, we, I see things that are based on great IP, um, but sometimes they are just a rehashing or a retelling and there's not a great character-driven story behind them. On the flip side of that, there are passion projects uh, that become so much of a passion project uh, that you know you lose sight of you know just telling a good story there too. And so it it really is you know I hate to say it, but it's kind of like that elevator pitch synopsis, like that when you first see that, whether it's an IP or it's not an IP. Does it have something new to say? Uh, does it have something that hasn't been played with before that would give you a chance to really push the envelope? And is it just a good character-driven story? And that 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 is, you know, whether it's 
He-Man, Castlevania, or something original, those things are independent of that. It's, you know, it's what the writing team and the creators put into it that, that determine that, as opposed to whether it's an IP or an original. Right. So um, something I, I thought of that uh, I feel like there has to be a number of creative studios who are, who are in this beginning phase, or maybe budding animation studios, who are listening mm -hmm. and going, oh my gosh, I have to balance amazing visuals, cutting edge visuals, amazing storytelling, uh, fantastic writing in that regard, um, nail the production, and try to continue to shop my studio around to get other projects. So when you're in that early phase, before you, know, you can become a powerhouse, what do you have to be doing? Uh, that's a great question. And not only are you doing all of those things, but you're also literally creating life out of nothing. Yeah. At the end of the day, your job is there's a blank canvas and you're making drawings feel like people and make people relate to, you know, scribbles on a piece of paper or on a tablet, however you want to, yeah. want to look at it. I mean, it's the most, and, and that's, that's the attracting thing. It's the most incredible thing in the world to see, you know, people relate to characters and believe in them that are just a, a sequence of, of drawings. I mean, it's, it's, and that's, it's kind of the addictive thing that once you're in animation, it's really difficult to leave because it's, it's, an, it's magic. But with all of this business, with all of this, you know, sort of stuff piled up on top of it. And the, the best thing that I, I can recommend is animation is a team sport. Like it, it takes a lot of people to do animation. A lot of people coming in will want to be the writer and the creator and the musician and the animator and want to do it all themselves and you know take the best scenes and all that other sort of stuff. But if you do that, it will take you forever to produce anything. And be honest, by the time you're done with the amount of time it took you to do, you're going to be better at the end of it than you were at the beginning. And then it's going to feel less than. And so like my 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 best advice is to, you know, find other talent. Find the people that are better at things that you do uh, and let them do those things. I'm a big believer in, uh, even though you might have feedback on the music, um, you let the composer compose. Even though you might have feedback on the storyboards, you let the storyboard artists do their job. Mm -hmm. you, 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 there's a reason you're hiring super talented people to do the specific job you're hiring them for. And you should trust them, give them some space to be creative, uh, you know, watch and give notes, all of that other sort of stuff, but let people who are better at you do that stuff as opposed to trying to weigh in and take over everything. In wrangling your group of really creative people and talent at your studio, how has uh, uh, the pandemic affected your process, if any? It, I mean, it, it's affected us a lot. I mean, Though not a deadline has really shifted on any of our projects at the end of the day, animation is something that can be done at home. It does, you know, affect the way that, that we work as a studio. The, the animators have a lot more time to uh, work on drawing without interruption. So that, that they're definitely kind of enjoying a little bit of the experience. But, you know, for producers and other people working on it, it is, it is difficult not being around everybody and getting to see the magic happen every day while you're trying to dissect, you know, line item spreadsheets and things like that. Um, but, you know, the, the technology, just like the way that I'm speaking to you guys now um, is, is incredible. We're having zoom meetings and we're sharing, you know, animatics and things like that online that we could all look at and give notes on. So it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's changed things. Um, and I'm not going to say it happens without, difficulty but for the most part things are are still firing on all cylinders um you know it the one good part about it is being a texas-based studio um we were living in a, a time where you know i would have to fly out to la you know quarterly maybe twice a quarter to go out and have meetings and pitch and all of that and this has shown you know that you can pitch a show remotely you can do a lot of stuff which i hope will open doors for uh, animators in Detroit and animation studios in Austin and people all over the world uh, to be able to do things from different places that have creatives that maybe can't leave or you know have the ability to try something new. So like 
I'm hopeful that it's, you know, even though there's some definite frustrations and speed bumps with it, that it's kind of breaking down some of the norms that were barriers to places outside of New York or Los Angeles uh, into the market. Are there any types of methodologies that you guys have employed to kind of keep the process flowing and to keep your team on track or to keep the communication high? Or, you know, what's even more difficult in this time is to be creative, to be able to think of new ideas or come up with a scene or build out uh, a new character or something like that. And I feel like this is a, a time where that becomes really, really difficult. So how do you keep the creative process in tow? Well, you know, it's, it's a great question and something that we're, we're dealing with in real time. So one thing that we found, especially over the past few weeks, is like there's a lot of anxiety and there's a lot of stress. And truth is, I, I heard this from someone else, but uh, it was a really good quote, like, as opposed to working from home, sometimes it feels like you're living from work. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're encouraging our people to make sure that they are taking breaks, that they're getting away from it. They're clearing the mind space and not just completely living with it scene to scene to scene. Um, you know, there's a lot of animation that, you know, becomes kind of like a, a Zen sort of thing. And what's cool is you can sit down and kind of turn part of your brain off and, you know, a lot of stuff happens creatively, but you could burn yourself out pretty quick doing that uh, constantly. So, you know, we're trying to encourage people to, you know, take breaks, make sure they're not overworking and all of that other sort of stuff. Because truth is, as, as much as you know, I, I hate to say this, it's sometimes it's hard to pull animators away, you know, from projects. They, they're constantly working and building on that. And so that's something we're struggling with a little bit. Um, but if we're being honest, like I said, I have a very young studio and uh, a director might be next door within, you know, 20 steps of the person in the next room working on storyboards, they were still talking about it over chat, you know, yeah. and still sending each other videos back and forth. So at the end of the day, that kind of communication for them has not changed really all of that much. Mm -hmm. So um, you were talking about Texas. Austin Pride, mm -hmm. I imagine, is, is very prevalent in your studio and where you guys have come up from, where your talent is from. Um, so, uh, so you guys are very about I believe, supporting the Austin community and people in your community. And I feel like that's very similar to Detroit in a lot of ways um, and studios around the area as well. So how has that mentality affected your business? That's a good question too. Um, at the end of the day, right, work ethic has a lot to do with it. And uh, I work with several people from Detroit, one of our incredibly talented uh, animators who's one of the directors on uh, uh, he-Man currently and, and did a lot of wonderful stuff on Say Smallos. Uh, Patrick Standard is, is from Detroit. And then uh, uh, the EP, the executive producer we work with on Castlevania is also from Detroit. And, uh, you know, there's kind of a, a similar spirit of work ethic, I think, in parts of Texas and, and parts of Detroit. So, you know, uh, I, I think I was joking with somebody when we were talking about the Startup Nation thing the other day. It's like, you can't outwork somebody from Detroit. Like right. Once they see that you're trying to work harder, they're going to Just work harder. Bit, right. and th there's, there's a similar mentality, uh, I think, uh, in trying to prove uh, that you can do that work from Austin as well. I mean, Austin's always been the film community. It's always been an artist hub. But, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, a chip on the shoulder about you know, folks from LA and, and other parts of the world that uh, we want to prove that we could do the, the same caliber, if not better, uh, uh, that can be done anywhere. And so uh, that has a lot to do with it. You know, Austin is a very unique city inside of Texas. It's not much like the rest of the state. Um, you know, it's, it has kind of uh, hippie roots and all of that other sort of stuff. So it's just, it's a great place for art and film to happen. And so it's a, uh, always been a source of pride uh, with us and we love working with companies like Dell you know because they, they're local too they started off in the same place that we started off with and we feel the same way about working with other studios like Rooster Teeth and other creators and and things like that in the Austin area because we we want to make sure that we are promoting that sense of community uh, so that it will grow because in, in film especially you know the more post studios we have the more recording houses which don't just service powerhouse but service 
a whole bunch of other businesses, the better. So uh, working with people in the community definitely long run helps your business. In building up the animation community in Austin, do you feel, I know you you kind of mentioned it there, um, that best animation can happen from anywhere. It doesn't have to be specific to LA or Toronto or any major animation hub, but just anywhere. Is that the case now? Do you believe? Oh, absolutely. Like, I mean, when when we're living that truth, you know, we're, we're proving that hypothesis currently. I mean, the first hire, you know, we used to always ask when you're, you're hiring somebody to work on a show, like, are you willing to relocate to Austin? Like right now our studio is not planning on reopening in, in the short term. And so we're working remotely with a lot of people. And so we didn't just prove that from Austin with a group of a hundred people, we could do what we're doing, but people are proving on a day-to-day basis that, you know, from at your house, wherever you live, you, you know, with the right skill set and the right team, you can produce amazing animation. That's great. Now, the future of your studio is probably uh, evolving as we go through the present situation and as new projects come on board uh, for you all. So what is the future for Powerhouse and how have you been involved in kind of crafting that general direction or coming up with a roadmap of what's to come? I mean, I I really hope that we're at the forefront as best as we can about breaking the barriers of what animation can be. Like, you know, my, the chip on my shoulder has always been being told that animation for adults or animation for certain demographics or animation that is on certain topics uh, can't be done. Like you have to work within these little demographics and these pockets of taxonomy. I mean, for what it's worth, we deal a lot with because we do action animation that's highly inspired by, you know, Eastern animation and anime and things like that. You know, there's even the fans of that sometimes can be pretty, you know, uh, this is not what we do is not anime uh, because we're doing it from Texas. It's not being done in Japan. At the end of the day, I don't really care what you call what we do, like the taxonomy of, you know, the category that you put our work into doesn't matter so much as did you enjoy the story? Did you relate with the characters? Did you really dig that badass fight scene? Like, and so hopefully the more stuff like what we're doing and other people are doing now too, uh, will continue to break that down and it will not be such a categorized medium. Uh, and it will be more about the subject and the art and the characters that you're making as opposed to, you know, fitting in a, in a specific peg. Mm-hmm. And now that we have so many streaming services, so many different ways to consume com- uh, content, are those walls kind of being broken down for animation? I think so. I mean, I, you know, we are pitching wonderful, crazy stuff all the time. We're hearing pitches that are wonderful, crazy things all the time. Like I, I, again, I patting ourselves a little bit on the back. I do think Castlevania went a long way in its success to permanently break a little bit of that. And now we're just trying to tear the whole wall down. I mean, shows you could even see it on shows that are kind of demographically based, but you know, uh avatar uh steven universe they're all playing with subjects um and and things that are a little outside of the cookie cutter things that we all used to have to work on well that's great i think that's exciting not just for animation but for all creative industry that we're kind of evolving on that path together and and breaking down those boundaries and coming up with interesting weird cool uh, badass ideas that we haven't before. So that's really exciting. And thank you and your studio for kind of leading that charge in that capacity uh, yeah, to a degree. Um, so I definitely think that it would be a great time for us to answer any comments that we have. I don't know if we want to bring uh, Sean back in and t- tackle some of those. Hopefully that there's some really good uh, comments that we could uh, jump into. Absolutely. <clears throat> so yeah, a lot, lot of comments uh, from the audience, uh, you know, loving the the content so far. And we've got a handful of questions here right now. Uh, I'll start with the, the first one here. Uh, can you add some more specifics to young kids, say 14 and up, to build a portfolio uh, and to be able to submit those to studios and how they might go about doing that? Yeah, um, kind of to the point I said earlier about how animation takes a lot of time. Uh, a trap a lot of schools fall into and a lot of people looking to break into animation is they 
they kind of want to make a, a piece, like a, a mega piece, like something that, you know, is two, three minutes long and is like a, a piece that expresses, you know, a lot, like has a lot of development. The issue with that is uh, it takes a long time to do, especially if you're doing it by yourself. Animation is a team sport. And so um, what I always try to uh, tell people who are looking to build a portfolio to do is it's less about, you know, the character that you designed. It's more about, you know, the, the part of the field that you're looking to get to. If you're looking to be a character designer, that matters a lot. But if you're looking to be an animator, you know, I'd rather see a whole bunch of short five second, three second, one second clips that really show that you understand action, uh, that you can quickly, you know, sketch that out with rough gestural drawings uh, and, and make it very readable uh, because that on a day to day basis, that's what you're going to do. Rarely are you going to be the person who takes something from inception all the way through post. And unfortunately, a lot of schools and a lot of students kind of go that route. Um, and so, you know, it, it makes for portfolios that are uh, don't have a lot of pieces uh, and have a lot of re repetition and things like that. Uh, my uh, Sam, the guy I keep mentioning, he's he's a big fan of people just doing fan based stuff like, you know, take your favorite character, whether it's Naruto or whatever, and do like a super quick, you know, few punches, few kicks and then move on to the next thing. Man, I, I wish I had that advice. Six years ago, I was heading into animation school and I fell into that trap of like, one big thing, it has to be this massive piece that I'm most proud of. And instead, we, I wish I would iterate it. We all do. I mean, I wish I had that same advice 20 years ago too. So I mean, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's one of those things where, unfortunately, a student in an art is a student. And so by the time they've gone through the process of making something like that, that's when they learn all the stuff that they would want to redo. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it's, a, it's a problematic uh, way of, of building a portfolio. That's great. Great. The, the next question here uh, is from one of the attendees, uh, and, and they work with many middle school children that have shown love and appreciation and skill for, for animation. And the question mm -hmm. is, is there any recommendations on entry-level software for helping them to convert to the digital side as they acquire uh, uh, technologies like pen and tablet and equipment like that that would uh, help them? Yeah, I mean, the Adobe software is pretty ubiquitous. I mean, it, 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 you're, it's something that everybody is going to use at some point in time in their animation career. Like, there are higher, you know, uh, expensive software that we do use on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, things like Toon Boom, which is great software. Uh, we we use to to make a lot of our shows, but you know when someone's just coming in, you know those student Adobe packages that allow you to play and animate where you can rough something and hit enter and watch it go without the camera, like I talked about in the other speech. So that's a really great great way to learn and start off with the fundamentals: bouncing balls, flower sacks, all that stuff uh, that you see in the old uh, Disney animation books. You can still play with in that software and do it quickly and learn a lot. Um, and then, you know, because of those packages, especially the, the the student ones, then if you wanted to dabble and see if you fall in love with compositing or other parts of the process, backgrounds, uh, we do most of ours in Adobe Photoshop. So, like, you know, that it's a, it's a, there's just so much material on how to learn the software out there that it allows you to concentrate less on the software and more on the fundamentals, which is, is what students should be doing. Brett, do you have any other material that might be helpful aside from picking up software, uh, movies, books, anything like that, that would kind of guide someone who wants to get into animation? Well, I mean, I, even though uh, animation has changed quite a lot, a lot of the original books uh, for animation, they still have the same uh, value that they had because again it's about the fundamentals i'm a big fan of uh the richard williams books uh he was an amazing animator uh and he's got some that are online and you could watch you know actual videos of his um on how to do things like the bouncy ball and the flower sack and walk cycles and things like that um and he he taught the animators at disney and he would go around and do presentations on animation just an amazing uh, Richard Williams is his name. Uh, so that's that's an amazing book. 
the Preston Blair book that you see in, you know, the hobby stores still holds up, you know, the, the advice on overlap and arcs and animation, all that stuff, those fundamentals are still true. Um, and then of course, you know, books like uh, The Illusion of Life by uh, some of the nine old men at Disney. Uh, it's, a, it's a big thick volume, but it is kind of the Bible of traditional animation. Great. We have another another question um, with regards to you know the the evolving landscape of of technology uh, that that drives uh, animation and and how as a studio do you keep up with with that? You mentioned uh, about the iPhone and Flash, uh, but obviously this this industry changes rapidly. So you know, do you invest as a studio into keeping up with that technology, and how best do you go about doing that? I mean, it, it kind of happens strangely organically because what, what happens is animators really push themselves. They love experimenting with other softwares and trying to find out quicker ways to do things because animation is uh, it, it's a laborious process. And so anything that saves a step and allows you to be you know, concentrate more on the actual creative than the actual process is, is really helpful. So, you know, uh, we, we, we were always a very, I wouldn't say anti 3D, but we were a very 2D studio. And so we didn't dabble in, in 3D software quite so much. Um, but we brought in talent uh, to be backgrounds artists and they would play around with 3D in order to help facilitate some of the stuff in their backgrounds. And then that started us experimenting with it. And then eventually, you know, we have hired 3D staff uh, who are incredible and have improved our show so much to do some of the things in 3D. Uh, and we might paint over them or we might give them a treatment to make them fit within the 2D worlds. But the amount of time that they gave us on vehicles and backgrounds and castles and all of that other sort of stuff is, has really, really pushed us as a studio. And it comes from the artists. It's like, I would love to say that, you know, Powerhouse has a development program where we go out and research and experiment with things and uh, all of that. But really, it's driven by the amazing talent that we have at the studio because they're constantly trying to improve their game. That's great. That's great. Um, I think that's it for, for now for the questions uh, since we're at the, uh, the top of the hour here. So I'll, I'll leave it to you guys to have a uh, closeout. Great. Well, Brad, thank you so much uh, for being on with us. I think everything you guys are doing at Powerhouse is great, cutting edge in the industry, and I'm super excited to see what's around the corner. Anything you could tease us with as we, uh, we close out with what you guys are working on in addition to what you might have already mentioned? Well, uh, the, the pro one of the projects you mentioned, Gods and Heroes, that one is probably the next one that will be out from our studio, and we're excited about it. It's, uh, it was done from our offices in LA mainly, uh, designed from Austin, but uh, a lot of the direction and storyboarding took place at our, our Glendale office. Uh, so that will be exciting. It's a Greek mythology story, which is always fun. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, He-Man is looking really, really, really good. Uh, and we're excited for the world to see that. Uh, being able to play with something, and, you know, I, won't, I know we're out of time, but like the great thing about He-Man for an animator is uh, he didn't do much in the old show, even though we all loved them. There was a lot of like dodging lasers and throwing a sword back and forth, but there wasn't a lot of <laughs> like actual <laughs> fighting because you couldn't do that back then. Uh, we're super stoked because uh, this is the He-Man that uh, everybody always wanted. This is the one where you're, you'll actually get to see all these great characters that you know and love actually fight one another. So it's exciting. Well, that's great. All right. Well, on behalf of Startup Nation, uh, Dell, and also Detroit Startup Week, thank you so much, Brad Graber. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Good luck. <laughs>